hours before kick, make sure everything is working and, and all the monitors and everything. And, you know, the thing that's the challenge is, you know, it, it's nice not to travel. And I think in this environment, it, you know, puts people at ease for the most part. Um, but when you're, when you're trying to broadcast a game, you don't have, for example, the spotter next to you in the booth. You don't have the stats guy next to the, to you in the booth. You don't have atmosphere. You don't have noise in the stadium, even though there's limited crowds, that whole environment is just, for lack of a better term, stale, you know, and you've got to create your own energy. You've got to be able to get jacked on your own and get excited uh, because it's the only way to broadcast it. And if you don't, then you're going to come off as, as not being enthusiastic and not being exciting. We certainly don't want to do that. Sure. Tom Lugan, Bill, on the Out of Bounds Show, ESPN 105.9 The Zone. Before I get into a little bit of Ole Miss and MSU, did you have a one big takeaway from from last weekend as you were able to both watch and call games? Um, you know, it, it's interesting. I, I, I think it's what we're seeing, and I've done two weeks in a row now, and I've had several coaches calls as, as we prep for our games. And so much of those calls that we've had in, in gathering information have, of course, revolved around COVID. How are you managing your schedule? How are you altering your schedule? How are you deciding to alter practice? Are you altering practice? And, you know, when you heard the comments come from Navy head coach Ken Niamatololo, uh, off of their disastrous performance versus BYU, where he revealed that they chose not to do any contact any one-on-one, any 11-on-11 in preparation for their game, well, no wonder they came out and looked like they'd never practiced. And so I think a lot of the coaches had to make guesstimates. They had to make preparation shifts and adjustments that maybe they normally wouldn't do because they're trying to protect their roster. And we saw, I think, limited contact. We saw maybe limited time on the field impact teams like Iowa State, who was replacing 144 starts in the offensive line and couldn't run the football a lick. We saw the same thing at Kansas State, replaced all five offensive linemen, really struggled, ended up losing to Arkansas State, Uh, had Texas Tech last week. They almost lost to Houston Baptist. And here's the thing, Bo, and this is the the part of college football that nobody's talking about enough, is – these teams all have their testing protocols, right? And their last test of the week is on a Friday. And when they figure out the Friday results, they may be going through the entire week with who they think is going to be their starting 11 or their starting two deep, and they could find out on a Friday with the game the very next day that they're, that they're not going to have three guys or five guys or ten guys. That happened to Texas Tech last week. The week before, Texas State, how about this one, Bo? They go into the week leading up to their SMU game, lose their entire, their entire tight end position, the whole entire room. One guy tests positive, four guys contact traits. All, right? all four of those guys tested negative, but it doesn't matter. They get put into quarantine. So a week before their opener, they have to take two offensive linemen and a defensive tackle and put them at tight end. Well, think about the competitive advantage that that gives the opponent when they see extra offensive linemen on the field. What do you think's coming? They're not going to throw it to them. Right. All right. And so, and now think about this from a from 130 some odd teams that are all going through this, not knowing until the last day of the week, the day before the game, who they're actually going to have to field a team. That's going to impact everybody. And I don't think people are talking about it enough. That's a great point. And it, yeah, and it impacts the. The line and everything else. All right. Tom no Luganville. Wow. National College Football Analyst ESPN on the Out of Bounds Show. So, Lugs, we've, we've had some great conversations with you over the years. And this past year, we had two freshman QBs start in the Egg Bowl. And I thought with everything that was thrown at them last year, they both really played well, considering what was around them and, and staffs and so on, in Garrett Schrader and John Rice Plumley. Here's what's Mm -hmm. wild right now. Neither one of them are going to start the first game of the season, one. And two, it looks like one or both will be at different positions. Garrett Schrader is taking reps at wide receiver. Um, This is kind of a a, a red, you know, this is a year where you can do whatever you want for all these players type deal. 
And I just kind of wanted to get your thoughts on the fact that, um, you know, Leach is going to go with KJ Costello. It looks mm-hmm. like Kiffin with Matt Corral. And how wild is it, Lugs, that these two guys who start, who I thought played well as true freshmen, considering the circumstances in our league, will will not start and could possibly playing be playing a different position in a week and a half? Well, I, there's two things I take away from that. That they've not only been outperformed, which tells you a lot about their quarterback depth, because as you mentioned, both of those guys have started games and have looked good at times, particularly John Rice Plumley. But it also tells you that the, the, their quarterback room is strong. They've got good talent. They've got good depth. Now, the other thing you're mentioning in relationship to practicing at other positions, that is something that is becoming increasingly normal. Uh, talking with coaches across the country about what they're, they're labeling as cross-training and playing multiple positions with multiple guys uh, to be prepared for any type of COVID hit, um, to, if you're, if you're thin, if you're, you know, injured and playing multiple players at multiple positions and practicing them like that. See, I don't think it necessarily means that they're, they're going to not play quarterback anymore. What I think it means is that they're still going to be involved at quarterback, but can also help the team in another area because they're good athletes. They provide options. And again, they can cross train a multiple position. So just like we're seeing on defense where safeties are taking corner reps and corners are taking yeah. safety reps and outside linebackers are taking safety reps, you've got to prepare for this, these chess pieces that are moving all across the board um, as it relates to, to training. So I'm not surprised by that. Um, and, and we'll see. Listen, both K.J. Costello and Matt Corral got to go out and perform. Right. They, they got to go out and maintain the starting position. So it's early. They haven't played a game yet. We saw this last week how a lot of teams looked like they hadn't been practicing for very long or didn't look like a very well-oiled machine, which I think could be expected. Some teams looked very, very good. So I think a lot of that depends on how you're preparing and how you're training in camp. All right, let me throw this out at you. Um, and, and Tom Luganville played quarterback at Georgia Tech, and we love talking about that position and, and – um, working through it with, with Lugs. Um, there's a kid named Will Rogers, who's from Brandon, Mississippi, who, for whatever reason, was not as highly rated as a lot of people in this state because he plays 6A football for a good program and played very well. His dad's the offensive coordinator there. Now, he committed early to MSU, so a lot of times that kind of takes you out of the, uh, maybe the spotlight, Lugs, if you will. Um, yeah. And But Leach offered him. Leach was his first offer at Washington State because the whole Gardner Minshew tie to Brandon, okay? Okay. And, yeah. and Will Rogers has beat out Garrett Schrader mm-hmm. for the number two spot in Startville, and they're, they can't – the staff and people within the program can't stop talking about him. Yet he was the ni- – he was ranked the 19th best, if you will, recruit in the state of Mississippi mm-hmm. – last year, even though he played at a 6A school that won a lot? Yeah. So, my answer to that is, go back and look at the quarterback that Mike Leach has had at Washington State and at Texas Tech, and you will find that really none of them were highly recruited. They were all guys that he felt was best for what they do. That's the one thing you got to understand about Mike Leach. He doesn't give a damn what anybody else thinks. He doesn't care who is rated where, who they're rated by. All he cares about is what he thinks of them and whether or not he believes that they are a good fit. And understand, it is such a quarterback-friendly scheme. Because, I mean, what have we seen from this scheme over the years? One guy throws for 4,000 yards and 40 touchdowns. Maybe he plays for two years. Next year, another guy does it. And then the next year, another guy does it. None of them are NFL guys, all right? But for whatever reason, the way this offense is devised, it's quarterback friendly and you can flourish in it. And, you know, he's always had good weapons. They've always had good personnel around the quarterback. Um, I don't think that will be any different here um, at at Mississippi State. So that doesn't surprise me all that much when when you look at the history of the quarterbacks that he's had that he's coached. Okay. And it – 
you know, he's kind of had a breakthrough now with Gardner Minshew. And and people yeah. believe that Minshew has some uh, staying power in the NFL. Let me give you a quote here. Because um, we you talked to you about... 19 for 20? Yes. <laughs> All right, so Jim, and you talked about Minshew a couple years ago when you got to call those games when he was a senior at Washington yeah. State, and they ripped off 11 wins and hosted game day and all that cool stuff. Um, Jim Nagy, or Nagy, yeah. uh, executive yeah, director Nagy. of the Senior Bowl, here was yeah. his quote, and I, I want to get your thoughts on this with Minshew. We're visiting with Tom Luganville on the Out of Bounds show. If Jacksonville ends up with the number one pick and take Trevor Lawrence, they will be using best player available over need. QB is not the Jags' issue. Gardner Minshew is a real player, not just a fun story. Your thoughts, Luke? Well, based off of production and performance so far, I don't think he's wrong. It it would be hard to argue with that statement, really. Um, If if you're going to build around him, then yes, you would not take a quarterback, and I would totally agree with Jim that you would be taking the best player on the board, and you might be taking that best player on the board as trade bait. Um, with the ability to uh, potentially uh, better your roster by holding on to him and and making some moves down the road, so that doesn't surprise me at all. Now, listen, it's it's early. We've got a we've got a long way to go here. But sure. listen, there have been, there have been people in training camp each of the last two years with Gardner Minshew that couldn't beat him out. You know, you go to court to camp every year, three or four guys, you whittle it down, and nobody could beat him out. So there's. There's got to be some proof in the pudding there. Tom Luganville on the Out of Bounds Show. So, so Lugs, this air raid thing was considered gimmicky forever. You know, they were at Iowa Wesleyan and Valdosta, and they eventually made the yeah. breakthrough to Kentucky, and they have success. And then Stoops pulls this really, incre- you know, stones of steel hire and hires a dude that's going to sling it around at Oklahoma that had been run the wishbone for 100 years. So, And then we yeah. start to see what happens, right? And and now the air raid um, or variations of are are everywhere NFL college and so on. So I want to ask you: You were one that that told us Kyler Murray could play. That we started talking to you about Kyler um, years ago. Year and I think y'all were mm-hmm. high on him, and I was sitting there going, "How is this going to work?" He didn't look good at A and M. Maybe that wasn't his fault. That yeah. may have been culture and fit and so on. And then now, all of a sudden, everything's working out. You probably didn't get a chance to watch them Sunday because of your show and other things. But this dude, I mean, he played like an absolute gamer. And mates, as a former quarterback, you would have been proud of the throws that he hit time and time again yesterday. Tom? So I've, um, and I've probably said this to you on your show, but I've told many people privately and publicly that outside of being 5'10", outside of being 5'10", Pound for pound, he's the best quarterback we've ever evaluated in 15 years at the high school level. If he was, if he was 6'2 or 6'3 or, you know, whatever you want to say your measurable standard is supposed to be, you could make an argument that he might be the highest ranked player, regardless of position, that we've done in 15 years. So what you had to get past was can he stay healthy, could he see the field, all of those things. Um, what you didn't have to get past and you had to accept as fact is he didn't lose. He, he, he didn't lose in high school. You mentioned the Texas A&M situation. He gets to Oklahoma, and all the guy does is win football games. And then you marry him with Cliff Kingsbury and, and, and what the offense is, and there's already familiarity there. Um, he's, he's a remarkable player. Now, I will say one thing about the air raid, the true air raid, which is going to be – the the person that's tweaked it probably the least has been Mike Leach. You know, we've seen Dana Holgerson, Art Bryles, um, a variety of different guys, you know, make some shifts and some changes to it. Jake Spavital is another one. There's a, there's a bunch of them out there. Some have included a lot more of the run game. My concern with the true air raid in the SEC West is what happened to it if you're not able to effectively run the football and the defensive fronts, the good ones, the Auburns, the Alabamas, the LSUs, uh, what happens when they start eating you alive up front? Mm -hmm. Like, are are you able to, are you able to compete? Are you able to score in the red zone when you get down there? If you can't run the ball, that's, and those are, those are things 
that you didn't see much, if any, of in the Big 12, in the Pac-12, because you don't have anywhere near the defensive personnel, particularly in the front seven, that you have in the SEC. Will Leach adjust. Interesting. Um, yeah. Hmm. Tom Luganville on the Out of Bounds Show. Blake, you got a question yeah, for Tom? That, well, I want to piggyback off that, Tom, because we've had Leach on the show and in studio, and we've had Steve Spurrier Jr. on the show, and Spurrier has said it, and uh, we've had Coach Mason, uh, offensive line coach Mason Miller on the show. All of them have mm-hmm. basically said, we're going to throw the ball. Some have dropped numbers like 50 times a game. And Mason Miller said, look, we're going to get blown up at times, but we're going to have success at times. You're just going to have to deal with it. What do you think schematically <laughs> the offense looks like at Mississippi State this year when it comes to maybe percentage splits? Like how, how dedicated are – I mean, are we going to really see 50 throws a game? Do you think that's going to happen at Mississippi State this fall? Uh, potentially, but they're going to have to maintain possession of the ball enough to do it. Um, I mean, I think you're probably seeing a 70-30 split uh, pass to run. Um, you know, we all know so much of the run game in that in that uh, offense is, you know, the swing passes, the flat routes, uh, some of the screen stuff. It's an extension of the run game. It's not truly the run game. And so and I would, I would agree with Mason Miller. They're, they're going to get blown up at times. But again, from a passing game perspective, uh, are they going to be able to move the ball? Is there is that a proven, effective college passing game? Absolutely, it is, and it has been everywhere by everybody that has attempted uh, to run it. If you become so one-dimensional, though, and people start teeing off on you, and now all of a sudden you can't protect your quarterback, now now you're going to get impacted in your passing game as well. And I I always go back to this. If you, you guys may not remember this, but when Urban Meyer took the Florida job, when he, when he and Dan Mullen were at Bowling Green, they were at Utah, they weren't using a tight end. And then they got to Florida, and all of a sudden, they realized we better get a tight end in this offense. We just can't have a five-man offensive front and have these short edges where people can get after us. So that'll be interesting to see if, if the implementation of a tight end or more, you know, 11 personnel, one back, one tight end, or 12 personnel, one back, uh, two tight ends. Because you can still run the offense, but it'll be interesting to see if some bigger bodies in there help them out, and if they make that adjustment. And, all right, let, let's get a pick from Lugs real quick. We've got one minute. Yeah. Like, all right, Tom Luganbill, ESPN on the Out of Bounds show. Um, we've got Miami and Louisville. That, that's a big game. This weekend, yeah. two and a half point spread, Luke's. Who do you like and why? I like Louisville because I think Mikhail Cunningham got off to one of the fastest starts in college football. Um, four touchdowns last week. Outside of Trevor Lawrence, he might have been the best quarterback performance amongst Power Five quarterbacks, and they have confidence now. And I listen. I, it was good to see Miami rebound from an embarrassing shutout loss to Louisiana Tech in their bowl game and take care of a, a good UAB team. That team went 9-5. and five. But I want to see more out of Derek King. I, I didn't think we saw the Derek King that we had seen at Houston the previous couple of years, and I thought we saw the ultra-improved Mikhail Cunningham. I, I like Louisville in this game. And Georgia Tech and Jeff Collins, who was here for a while, and I just think he's a super yeah. bright guy, and you played QB at Georgia Tech. They had oh, yeah. a huge win uh, over uh, last weekend, should have won by more. Now they're playing Central Florida this weekend, so that's a top twenty matchup. Luke's, who do you like and why? Oh, uh, the better overall team right now, uh, as far as components, is probably UCF, but they've had over ten guys opt out due to COVID, so their depth is going to be depleted a little bit. And I think Georgia Tech's confidence, Georgia Tech's. Um, uh, renewed enthusiasm because they have found a quarterback. Jeff Sims is a, is a star in the making. I think that, that gives them a shot. My only concern is, is that UCF is going to be so much better, so much better than Florida State is on offense, that I don't know if Georgia Tech's in a position to get enough three and outs or to get off the field enough to give their offense a chance. We'll leave it there. Tom Lugan, Bill. National College Football Analyst, ESPN on the Parish Brewing Guest Line. Lukes, thank you so much, buddy. Be good. You bet. Be good. That was fantastic. Love it. A little bit of John Rice Plumley and Garrett Schrader. A lot of air raid there. And, uh, and Mike Leach. And how will it look in this league? Everywhere they've been, they've been successful. 
Kentucky, Oklahoma, Texas Tech, Washington State. You'll get to see it in a week and a half in Baton Rouge. <laughs> I think you'd probably want to warm up with like Missouri, Bandy, Arkansas, Kentucky, Will Muschamp. But anyway, you got the defending national champs in Baton Rouge. We're live in the Bank Plus studio. The show is powered by Blue Cross Blue Shield of Mississippi. It's good to be blue. The official health care provider of the Out of Bounds show, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Mississippi. <laughs> 